first lesson and notice the title of the lesson. Why the need for this study, folks? This is totally introduction, okay? Everything we're going to talk about tonight is introductory type material, laying the foundation for the rest of the lessons, okay? Uh, if you can bear with me tonight, it'll get gooder, okay? Yeah, I promise, it'll get gooder and gooder every time. And, uh, but just bear with me tonight. But we are asking the question, why in the world do we need a study on the second coming and judgment? Point number one, you ready? Got your pens going? Don't want to miss a blank, okay? The subject is a Bible topic, isn't it? Folks, and any topic addressed in the pages of God's Word is worthy of our study, okay? Now, notice the title. The Second Coming and Judgment, okay? And both of those things are set forth in God's Word, aren't they? So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to be doing quite a bit of reading because I want you to see that God's Word makes mention of these things, okay? So let's talk first about the second coming. Um, one of the first individuals to promise that Jesus would come the second time was Jesus himself. And folks, he makes the point just as bold and just as blunt as he can make it in John 14 verses 1 through 3. So if you got your Bible, turn there. If you don't have your Bible, there are pew Bibles there that you can pull out. And uh, we're going to be reading these verses. I want you to see these. Uh, some of the lessons that I do will be on PowerPoint, okay? We will do a few lessons on PowerPoint because we'll be putting some things side by side uh, when it comes to uh, uh, these studies, all right? Okay, let's see. need to... Somebody ha hold on to these, and if somebody comes in, y'all can kind of give these to them. That way. Who else? I got somebody else came in, too. Somebody hold on to these and kind of, will you hold on to them? No, we got plenty. I just uh, want anybody who comes in to be able to follow me and not have to just sit there. Listen to me. Uh, at least you can, you know, be bored by looking at it. <laughs> you don't have to be bored and, you know, terrified out of your mind at the same time. All right. Uh, notice what Jesus says. Jesus is talking specifically to his disciples. Folks, he's gathered them in the upper room. The crucifixion is approaching very, very quickly, okay? This is going to be the last time that he assembles them in a formal fashion before he's arrested and carried off to the cross of Calvary. And he says this, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. Now listen to him. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? Come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am... There ye may be also. Folks, you can't get any plainer than that, can you? I will come again. Do we have to read any more passages? We really don't have to read any more passages, do we? We've got the promise from the lips of the Savior himself that he's coming back. That's all I need. I've just got to read it one time in God's word. But the word of God talks about this second coming. A lot. In fact, Jesus talked about his second coming in other places as well. And one of the places where he taught it over and over and over and over again was in his teaching on the parables. And I've listed for you about six or seven different parables that talk about this second coming of Jesus. And let's just list them real quickly. Number one, the parable of the doorkeeper. The parable of the doorkeeper. And I've given you the references there. The parable, secondly, of the homeowner, okay? Uh, who can break into our houses if they so desire? What do we call those people? A thief, right? An old thief. Now, folks, if you know a thief is coming, what do you do? You prepare, okay? Boy, we got the... <laughs> 
We got it coming out of them tonight, don't we? Tell you what, we're going to have to tone these jokers down. Um, but we prepare for it. But folks, do you ever know when a thief is coming? No, that's the problem. That's what Jesus was liking his coming to, you know. If the door, if the homeowner had known, he would have prepared, would he not? But the homeowners never prepared. I remember one time uh, we had left and uh, gone out of the house and we came back late that night and boy, somebody had broken into my mom and dad's house. They had uh, stolen the microwave. They had stolen two or three guns, a little bit of jewelry, and we started walking around the house, and we had a fence on one side, and the microwave was sitting there. I guess they either got scared or it got too heavy, but they left the microwave, but they took those guns from us. Folks, my dad was a little upset, okay? Uh, those were hand-me-down guns and guns that he was going to give to his sons, and they were gone. Uh, if he'd known, guess what he'd done? He stayed home with the guns, Okay? I ain't going to tell you where the guns might have been or how the guns would have been used. but um, So Jesus talks about the homeowner. No, next, the, the parable of the steward. Okay, um, who, What is a steward? Servant. A servant? Come on, get more specific than that. He is, but what's a steward? Takes care of your possessions for an owner. Yeah, here's an owner that has all of these possessions and he takes care of those possessions for... The homeowner, does he not? And does the homeowner, if he has a good steward, does he have to be concerned about his goods? No. no. But guess what a homeowner can do at any time when it comes to his steward? Yes, he can take account of his steward, folks. And so Jesus talks about the parable of the steward and how the master can hold him to account for those things. The parable of the ten virgins. Everybody's familiar with the parable of the ten virgins, aren't they? Five were ready, five were not, and all of a sudden, when the five were, that were not ready had gone into town, there's the cry, the bridegroom cometh. Who's the bridegroom? Jesus Christ, folks. He's coming, isn't he? He's coming. That's what the parable teaches us. And uh, the next one, the parable of the talents. And I list for you uh, verse 19. Listen to this. After a long time, after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. Folks, what's he talking about? Second coming. Okay? The Lord of the house leaves. After a long time, he comes back and what? He takes an account of his servants. He's talking second coming again. The parable of the sheep and goats. That's found in Matthew chapter 25. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory with all of his holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and all nations shall be gathered before him. Second coming. When the Son of Man shall what? Come in the throne of his glory. Okay, so Jesus tells us over and over in the parables, guess what? I'm coming back, folks. You better be ready. I'm coming back. There's no doubt about it. Jesus dies. He's resurrected. He lives among men for 40 days. He gathers his disciples on a little hill just outside of Jerusalem known as Mount Olivet or the Mount of Olives. He speaks to those men just a few moments and then all of a sudden what happens? He ascends back to the right hand of God and as he ascending out of the clouds they look around and what do they see? The Bible says two men in white apparel, angelic beings, aren't they? Listen to what these angels said. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, two men stood by them in white apparel which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which was taken up from you into heaven, listen to him, shall so come in like manner as ye have what? Seen him go into heaven. I find that interesting. How long ago did, you, did those angels say those words to the apostles? How long ago has it been? About almost 2,000 years. Now listen to what he says. Okay, He says, Ye shall see this same Jesus coming again. Who's going to see him? Who, who are they talking to? The apostles. Isn't that interesting? 
You guys who are standing right here, who are going to die, who are going to be in the graves for thousands of years, guess what's going to happen to you one day? You are going to see Jesus coming again. Folks, he's talking more than just second coming, isn't he? If you really think about what he's saying, okay? Because he's promising a lot more than that. You 12, okay? Really 11 at the time, isn't it? You 11 are going to see me again, okay? Very, very interesting. Uh, there are three of uh, the New Testament writers that make mention of the second coming of Jesus Christ as well. And folks, I've only given three references, okay? And so don't think that I've given you everything there is in the pages of the New Testament on the second coming. I have not. We are barely skimming the surface all I want you to know is the second coming of Jesus has been promised over and over and over again. The Apostle Paul promised it. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16. Paul says, Jesus is coming, doesn't he? Peter says, for the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Peter says what? He's coming. John, the beloved apostle, the apostle of love, guess what he says? He says Jesus is coming. Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And who else? Yes, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. In other words, even so, so be it. John says he's coming and he's coming. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Jesus has said it. The angels have said it. Three inspired men have said it. Folks, I've set before you five witnesses of the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is real stuff, isn't it? It's not fake. If you believe the word of God, this is not fake. Jesus is coming again. And because the Bible teaches it, we need to be aware of it, don't we? Now, here's something that's interesting. This term, the second coming, is oftentimes referred to as a day. Okay? And so I want to run some of the references for you talking about how this day is described in the biblical text. Okay? And there are just numerous ones of them. Matthew 7, 22, that day, Jesus says, many shall say to me in that day, what day? The day of his coming, the day of judgment. Folks, they're all the same day. Okay? He says, the day of judgment, Matthew 12, verse 36. The last day, John chapter 6, verse 40, 44, 54. The day of wrath. That's an interesting term, isn't it? The day of wrath, Romans 2, verse 5. What day are we in right now, folks, if you're going to define this day? He says that that day is going to be a day of wrath. What day are we in right now then? The day of what? Last days. Yeah, we're in the last days, but, you know, if we're trying to contrast between the day of wrath and this time period right now. That day is going to be what? The day of wrath. What's this day? Okay. Yes. The day of mercy. The day of grace. Folks, right now you're living in a grace period, okay? But guess what? One day when he comes back, grace is gone. And guess what? It's a day of wrath and judgment of the Almighty God. Okay. Notice next, he says, the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, 18. The day of Christ, Philippians 1, 10. The day of the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. The day, just the day, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 4. Um, if I were to just say, the day is coming around a group of individuals who believe in Jesus Christ, what day do you think they would think about? The coming of Jesus Christ. The day is coming. Folks, guess what other days are coming? Is Sunday coming? Yeah, the day of worship is coming, isn't it? Okay. I may be talking about my birthday. The day is coming. I'll let you know. You can bring me some presents. 
Okay, the day is coming. But folks, that's not what you think of, is it? We don't think of any of those days. Anytime we're around a group of believers and we say, the day, that's not a descriptive phrase very much, is it? But as soon as it's said, guess what we know? We know exactly what we're talking about, don't we? The day. Notice also he refers to it as the day of God, 2 Peter 3, verse 12. He refers to it as the great day. Chapter 1, verse 6. And notice the last one, the great day of his wrath, Revelation 6, verse 17. Folks, here's something that's interesting. Are you ready? Every time the second coming of Christ is set forth unto us using this term day, it is always the day, not the days, plural. Got that? He never talks about many, 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 many days. He says it is the day. And notice what all he groups in there. He says it's the day of Jesus Christ. It's the day of God. It's the day of judgment. It's the day of wrath. It's the great day, and it all takes place when? On the day, not the days or months or years. I want you to get that firmly in your mind. This is an important point right here, okay? We're talking about one day, the last day, okay? Keep that in your mind. That, that, that's a, that, it's a, just an important biblical teaching that you need to get a hold of, okay? And one of these days, you might look back and you say, you know, old Vic said that was an important point, and I didn't get it back then, but I get it now, okay? One day that he's coming back, okay? Question. Our class title is The Second Coming of Jesus and what? Judgment. Is judgment mentioned in the Bible? Oh, man. Folks, again, I have not even touched the hem of the garment, okay? We haven't even begun to list all the passages of Scripture, and I've given you how many there? Six. Larry can see the number. I didn't say he could count. I said he could see the number. (laughs) Um, Notice what Jesus says. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account in the day of judgment. Romans 2 verse 5, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Romans 14 verse 10, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Hebrews 9 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, And after this, the judgment. And then there's 2 Peter 2.9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the the godly out of temptations and reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be what? Punished. Folks, the Bible talks about judgment over and over and over and over again. And we've got an entire lesson that we're going to devote to judgment, heaven, and hell, okay? So we'll be back on that subject pretty soon. So, first of all, we want to study this topic and look at this topic because it's Bible, isn't it? If I haven't convinced you by now, you need to leave. Okay, because you're unconvincible. Okay, just can't be done. But it is a Bible topic. Secondly, we need to study this topic because there are tons of people who are interested in it, aren't they? Just look at this little group of folks. You're interested, aren't you? Some of you don't even attend here, and guess what? You came. You didn't come for me. Surely not for me. You came, why? Second coming and judgment. Folks, as soon as you hear the words, don't your ears prick up? I can just be going through the channels on the television set, and if I see somebody preaching on second coming, guess what? I may not stay long. But as soon as I see it, I stop a minute. I listen to what that guy's got to say for a little while. It's just an interesting topic, is it not? Folks, hundreds 
and I mean that, hundreds of books have been written on this subject. Okay? Hundreds. And one of the best known series that has ever been written is a 16 volume set entitled what? Left Behind. Okay? 16 volumes. You got enough reading to do for the rest of your life for some of you. Okay? 16 volumes. That's a lot of volumes, isn't it? Folks, those books were written by uh, two men. One man named Tim LaHaye. Another man by the name of Jerry Jenkins. Okay? 16 volumes. 63 million copies sold. Chewy. I've always wondered about books, haven't you? How much does an author make on every book sold? Wouldn't you like to know that? One of these dudes just made a dollar a book. Sixty-three million dollars those jokers put in their pocket. Now they had to split it because there was two of them. But I think I could live on thirty-two and a half million dollars, couldn't you? That's just their books. From those books came three number one blockbusters at the movies, folks. Entitled, Left Behind. Okay? And they would put a dot, dot, a colon, and fill that in with something. Okay? Seven of those books that were written became number one. Number one bestsellers. Don't tell me that our society isn't interested in second coming, okay? Because that's what the books deal with, left behind, second coming, individuals buying those books like crazy, okay? So it is a topic of interest. Now, drop down to D there. Here was interesting. This was from a uh, poll that came out by Pew, okay? And... There are a lot of people, if you go around asking them, is Jesus going to come back in the next 40 years? Guess what they say? Yes. Folks, I don't know about you. If I thought Jesus was coming back in the next 40 years, man, I'd be a little interested in that, wouldn't, wouldn't you? I might even live to see that. Okay, now some of you, I'm sorry. <laughs> But, but uh, you know, I'm 94 years old, next 40 years, Jesus is coming. Just look at the numbers there. 27% of the people asked said, definitely, he's coming in 40 years. It's amazing, isn't it? Another 20% said, probably, probably. Now add those two numbers there, that gets how many people? 47%. Almost 50% of those who say they believe in Jesus Christ think he's coming back probably, definitely, within how many years? 40 years. Wow. That's pretty soon, isn't it? It's been 2,000, and you're drawing down to the last 40? I'd get a little interested, wouldn't you? I'm telling you. Now, notice the rest of them. 28% said probably not. 10% said definitely will not. Now that's a pretty big group of people, isn't it? Okay. And there's a reason for that if you understand some of the belief systems that are out there about second coming. Okay. But notice there's 14% who told the truth. Isn't that right? Don't know. And folks, if they'd come asking me and don't know would have been on there, I'd put DK. <laughs> Just don't know. Because the reality is, I don't know when he's coming. The question was asked, do you believe that Jesus is going to be coming back within the next 40 years? That was the question. I don't know that. And neither does anybody on this planet. I'd like to talk about, talk to those 27%, don't you? Definitely. But let me tell you what, there's some preachers out there that would make people think that's the case. Did you know that? In fact, there's some of them teaching it so hard that they would have you to believe that he's coming tonight practically. And guess what? We don't know, do we? Just don't know. But folks, there's a lot of interest in second coming out there. 
okay? So that's another reason that we picked this topic to do a study in. Point number three, to clear up some of the confusion on the topic, okay? There's a ton of confusion, folks. Now, I'm about to run down a list of terms that you may or you may not have any clue about, okay? But folks, this thing that we're studying, when you get out of the Bible and you get into the views of all the religious groups and everything that all these men have to say, you can wear yourself out trying to keep up with it, okay? You see, there's a thing called historical premillennialism that deals with second coming. You ever heard of that? Just historical premillennialism. There's another belief called postmillennialism dealing with second coming events. There's a belief called dispensational premillennialism. Anybody heard of that one? Man, I hope you have. That is the main belief that is out there in society as far as the televangelists are concerned today. Dispensational premillennialism. Okay? There's a fourth view referred to as amillennialism or amillennialism. Okay? What's the word a mean, do you think? Huh? Not? Yes. Not. Okay? No millennialism, no thousand years. That's what millennium means, isn't it? Okay. You ever heard of Jane or, or, or of Herbert Armstrong? Ah, Herbert Armstrong has his own view about second coming, folks. Okay. Somewhat tied to premillennialism, but he has his own view of second coming events. Okay. You have to understand his view somewhat. They are similar to the next one, the Seventh-day Adventist views of the millennium. Okay? Got to know about what they believe. And have you ever turned on television and heard of a man named Jack Van Impey? You ever seen him? Anybody? Usually has a woman sitting right beside him. Her name's Roxella. Okay? I'm serious, that's her name, Roxella, and they they tag team on their show together, okay? She she introduces the show, and she reads the articles, and then she asks Jack all the questions, and he responds. He's memorized uh, like 10,000 verses of the Bible, you know? I mean, it's just ridiculous amount of verses that he's memorized, okay? And uh, he is real heavy on eschatology. That means the doctrine of final things, okay? Everything he talks about. All the news that he ever picks up, he go to a verse in the Bible, quote you that verse. Oh, yeah, okay? He's talking about that right here. And you're going, wow. You know, he's quoting from Ezekiel, and he's quoting from Joel, and he jumps over to Revelation, and he comes back to Paul. And you're going, oh, man, because he can just quote verses just like that, okay? But he's always focused on second coming events. Now, he and Roxella are getting a little bit older, Okay, and you don't see them quite as much. And if you ever see Roxella, you never believe that she's as old as she is. Okay, they're like 74, 75 years old. She looks like she's about 50, 55. Okay, the magic of surgery. Okay. <laughs> now, those are all the different views, okay? So that shows you that there is a lot of confusion out there, right? I started just to write a few quotes from some individuals today that show you how confusing it is. I said, nah, let's just look at some of the beliefs that are out there, okay, with regard to this stuff. Notice some of the uh, areas of confusion. There are some individuals who believe that Jesus is not going to come once. He's going to come twice, okay? Now, folks, I don't know about you. If he comes twice, that means two days. I thought we read about what? One One day. But they say, the first day he's going to come back and it's going to be an invisible coming. You're not going to see. Okay. But then there's going to be his next coming and it's going to be a visible coming. Now, are those views different than what we read in Scripture a little bit? Yeah. It's kind of confusing, isn't it? An invisible coming of Jesus. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Notice, secondly, 
The, will the righteous dead be raised from the dead a long period of time before the wicked dead are raised? Some say yes. Some say no. Okay, depending upon your view of second coming, you see. Confusion, right? Point number three. Will the righteous go through the tribulation period? Now, I've only got three views of that put in here, folks. Okay? Will they go through the entire tribulation period, which I'm told is seven years? Okay? Some say, oh, yes. Some say, oh, no. They'll only go through three and a half years of it. And some say, no, that's not true. They're not going to go through it at all. So, again, a lot of confusion, isn't it? I mean, you pick up one writer, you're reading about the tribulation, he says, oh, Christians are going to go through the whole tribulation period. Then you pick up the next writer, and he's talking about tribulation period, and guess what? Oh, no. Christians are just going to go through half of it, three and a half years. Then you read the next writer, and guess what he says? They're not going through it at all. Man, I'm totally confused. Aren't you? See, there's a tons of confusion to this stuff. Notice next. Who is the Antichrist? Isn't that the big question? Yeah. Folks, how long do you think premillennialism has existed? Does anybody have a clue about how long it's been around? No clue? <laughs> oh, yeah. Third, fourth centuries. Premillennialism started being developed. Okay. And guess what? Through all those centuries, guess who they've been looking for? The Antichrist. And I'll bet you there's been a thousand people who've been labeled the who? The Antichrist. And guess what? We've still got men out there today trying to label the who? The Antichrist, don't we? He wasn't Hitler. Hitler came, rose up, looked like the Antichrist, died. Oh, missed him. Got to be Mussolini. Nope, not Mussolini. Right? Oh, it's got to be Ahmadinejad. Nope, he's gone, isn't he? Don't hear much about him anymore. Who's the Antichrist? You see? It depends on who you read. Okay? And it depends on what time in history you've read. Doesn't it? But boy, they sure make you sound like we got this thing all wrapped up. We know exactly what we're talking about. They get up there and they just preach it and preach it and preach it. And then guess what? The Antichrist ain't the Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist? It's confusing, isn't it? It is to me. Notice this next one. Has the kingdom of Jesus Christ been established or is it yet to come? There's individuals who say the kingdom's already here. And there's individuals who say, no, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Kingdom's not been established yet. We're still waiting for the kingdom to come, right? It's confusing. Notice this, point number six. Is the end near or is there no way to know? Well, I tell you what, I got a lot of folks telling me it's near. You know, a lot of people tell me that. I, I, I ain't talked to people in church of Christ about that. Oh, yeah, end's near is coming. How near? I don't know. <laughs> well, could it be a million years? Well, it could be. That ain't near to me. That's a long way. See, they don't know, folks. Okay? But a lot of people will tell you what? Whew. It's near. Notice the next one. Is the church the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the kingdom? When you pick up all of this stuff about the second coming of Christ, much of what is written, folks, are quotes from the Old Testament. Okay? Now, if the kingdom is the church that the prophets were writing about, then guess what? Those Old Testament writers are not writing about a coming kingdom that everybody's waiting for now, you see. So is the kingdom in the Old Testament the church or is it 
really, like some say, the future kingdom that so many individuals talk about today. Folks, it's confusing, isn't it? Notice the next one. Is the thousand years of Revelation 20 literal or figurative? Folks, this is the only text in all the Bible that talks about the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Okay, the only text, Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6. Is that literal or is it figurative? Man, if it's literal, then you'd look at it one way, wouldn't you? If it's figurative, would you look at it another way? Oh, yeah. And there's a big discussion about which it is, okay? And notice that on our outline, we've got a whole class dedicated to what? The thousand-year reign. I dread it. <laughs> Notice this next one. Is the thousand years a fixed period of time or does it refer just to a long period of time? Okay? Is it really a set time? A thousand years, right? Or is it figurative and mean just what? A long period of time. Okay? Do we use figurative language sometime in our talk? Yeah, I preach 35, 40 minutes, and you know what the brethren say? Man, he preached for eternity. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Boy, 40 minutes is eternity. We got problems, you know. We, we got some major problems. But you see, we use figurative language, don't we? Well, does the Bible ever? So we have to, uh, we're going to have to get in here. We're going to have to do a little digging, aren't we? We're going to have to really talk about some things and... Uh, um, Try to be as honest as we can, okay? So we've got three reasons, right, so far as to why we want to study this topic. Number one, it's because it's a Bible topic. Number two, because there's a ton of interest that's in it. Number three, because there's tons of confusion about these subjects. And number four, we want to study this subject because we just want to simply learn the truth, don't we? A couple of passages of scripture. One of them is found in Proverbs 23, verse 23. The wisdom writer says this, Buy the truth and sell it not. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. Buy the truth and sell it not. Folks, what if truth costs everything you had? Okay? That's how high the cost is. Everything you had. Guess what the wisdom writer says? Buy the truth and sell it not. If it costs everything, you buy truth. That's how important truth is. Does Jesus tell us how important truth is? Sure. John 8, 32. And ye shall... Know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, verse 32. Folks, only truth frees man. Okay? Not error. Not false doctrine. Truth sets man free. Okay? Now, I've tried to show you from those two passages of Scripture that truth is vitally important. And that every one of us need to long for the truth with every fiber of our being. If there's anything you ought to want, it's what? Truth. I don't want error. I want truth. Guess how the only way to find truth is? To study. That's what 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 says. Study. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, listen to him, rightly dividing the what? The word of truth. Notice what Paul said, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's assume for a moment that you are going into the operating room, okay? And one doctor walks into you, he's young, he's stout. He holds it, he's holding a pen and he's signing all your papers. And man, his signature is pristine as it could be. Okay? Second surgeon comes in. He's a little older, decrepit a little. (laughs) 
And he goes to sign your papers. And he can't even hardly sign it. Now you tell me which one of them two surgeons you want operating on you. Oh, give me the old man. Can you imagine that dude with a scaffold in his hand? You know? Ain't no telling what he'd take out of you. Now, that's a funny little story. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Folks, that is a medical term in the Greek language. Okay? And you know what it means? To make a straight cut. Okay? Even way back then, they understood that if you're going to do surgery, you're going to cut on somebody, guess what you better do? You better make a straight cut, have you? You see, when it comes to the Word of God, and you're going to divide the Word of God, you better divide the Word of God with what? With a straight cut. You don't go all over the place. You cut it just the way it needs to be, rightly dividing the Word of truth. The American Standard Version says this, handling a right... The word of truth. There's a way to handle the word of God. And there's ways not to handle the word of God as well. We better handle the word of God correctly. Okay, secondly. When we find the truth, guess what we had better do? We better be led by it. According to Proverbs, I mean Psalm uh, 25 verse 5. And also, when we find the truth, you know what we had better do? We better speak it to other individuals. According to Ephesians 4 verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things which is the head, even Christ. Also Proverbs 8 verse 7, my lips shall speak of thy truth. Folks, once you have the truth, you've got to be led by it and you need to tell it to other people because the truth is the most important thing that is out there, is it not? There is such a thing as truth when it comes to every biblical issue. And we need to realize that. Now, let's look at point number five. Okay, We're going to spend an entire lesson at the very last of this class on this subject right here. Okay, Another reason we need to talk about and study the second coming of Jesus Christ is because we need to be ready, don't we? We need to be ready. We've made this point two or three times. When is Jesus coming? Nobody knows. Listen to this. This is Jesus talking. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven. Neither the Son, but the Father. Wow. That kind of rules out a lot of folk, doesn't it? No man. No angels. Not Jesus, just who? Just the Father. He's the one who knows. And any other human being who boasts that he knows is a what? He's a liar. That's all it is to it. Nobody knows but the Father. That's what Jesus said. Notice how that day is described. That day will come in such an hour as you think not, folks. Isn't that something? You're going to go out here and you're going to party. You're going to have a good time. You're going to do whatever you want to do. And all of a sudden, ah, he ain't coming today. Uh-oh. <laughs> Such an hour as you think not. Guess what? There he is. Here he is. Man. Better be ready, hadn't you? That day will come when you least expect the master of the house to come. When you were kids, your parents went away. Did you ever try to get away with stuff while they were gone? No, y'all are all good kids. It's just your kids that were so terrible, right? But you try to get away with a few things, and all of a sudden, what happens? Man, you hear the car in the driveway, you hear the key in the lock, you hear the door shut, or you hear Dad already walking down the hall. It's too late. It's over. Daddy's home. It's bad, isn't it? Guess what? About the time you think not, the master comes, doesn't he? He will come as a thief in the night and he will come as a woman in travail with a child. I've told the folks at Oceanside this. My uh, third kid, okay, my son, uh, we had moved from Fulton, Mississippi to um, Hayti, Missouri. 
that day. Had a truck loaded of junk, okay? Get there about 4 o'clock. We unload to 5.30. We change our clothes. We go to Bible class. We come back about 8.30 or 9. We unload the truck. We're finished at 12.15. My wife's pregnant as a big dog. Just, I mean, out there, guys. I sit down. Oh, I'm tired. She comes around the corner at 12.40 and says, Big, it's time. <laughs> I know exactly what Jesus said when he said he can come like a woman in travail. I looked at that woman. I said, you got to be kidding. And she said, I ain't. 12.40, that boy was born at 4.10 that morning. Okay? We had an hour and 40 minute drive to the hospital. Okay? Unbelievable. Now you know why I said, you're kidding. <laughs> oh, man. Now, folks, because of these things, you and I have to watch, don't we? And he tells us to watch. Okay? He tells us to be ready. He tells us to be persons of holy conversation and godliness. He tells us to look for and hasten unto the coming of the day of the Lord. And he tells us to be diligent. That we may be found in him in peace without what? Without spot and blameless, folks. Okay? So as we look toward that day, we have some responsibilities, don't we? And the responsibility is all summed up in one word. Watch. You be ready when he's coming. Now, we are about to enter into a study, folks, that is one of the most controversial studies in the religious world that you can get into. Okay? I just want you to know that. This is all introduction. This is real fun, you know. But... It's about to get pretty serious, all right? And as we study, here's what you're going to find. Number one, some of the things that we study are going to be very simple and easy to understand. You, you can't miss it, okay? It's just that simple. And you'll say, oh, yeah, I see that. But notice point number two. Some of the things that we study, we're going to find where the word of men contradict the word of God. And when that happens, you and I have a decision to make, don't we? And this individual could be somebody that I respect, that I love, that I care for, that's close to me, whatever. But if that person's word conflicts with the word of God, I've got a decision to make, don't I? And my decision is, whose word am I going to follow? And folks, I hope that all of us have a heart that we want to follow the Word of God. Okay? Point number three. Some things that we study just might not be as understandable as we would like them to be. Sometimes I hear individuals quote passages of Scripture from, take, for instance, the book of Revelation. Okay? And they make application of it. Oh, that's talking about this. Okay? Or that's talking about what happened in 1938 on April the 17th with these people. I look at that verse, I read the verse, and I say, where did they get that? Folks, some of these things are not as understandable as some individuals would love for us to believe they are. Okay? It's a lot more difficult than that. Okay? It's easy just to sit back and hear somebody say something and make an affirmation and quote a verse. It's another thing to do like the Bereans, right? But these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so, Acts 17, verse 11. Sometimes I've got to reevaluate, don't I? And then notice point number four, and we'll close. Sometimes we may not know exactly what a biblical text is saying. Okay? And folks, there'll be times when I'll just tell you, I don't know. And guess what? I don't know. I just don't know. But notice the second part of that, but, okay? Even though I may not know exactly what it is, 
A lot of times I can tell you exactly what it is not. You know what? Somebody may come along and make an affirmation. This is what that means. I look at you and I say, I don't know what it means. But guess what? I know it's not that. You want to know how I know that? Because what they're teaching contradicts what something else is said in the Word of God. And folks, if there's a conflict between what is taught and the Word of God, then I know it ain't that. Isn't that right? Even though I may not know exactly what it is, I can understand many times what it isn't. And so we need to be aware of that as we go into studies like this. Okay? So I'm trying to be honest with you. Uh, next week, bring your Bibles, bring your pens, bring your want-tos. Okay? Don't leave your want-tos at home. That's, that's bad when you get to Bible class and you don't want to be there. Um, and we will study the kingdom next week. Okay? Interesting study. Thank you very much. Look at there. Eight o'clock. <laughs> Thanks, Tommy,